allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tired of colors. I'm going to just go over a little bit about the end of World War I and um, why we're here today. Last several years, the county's been celebrating uh, the, uh, the remembrance of World War I. One person's missing today, uh, Freehilda John Bartlett. He's really been the lead person in this remembrance over the last three years, and it's, he's fighting a health issue right now, if you could just pray for him. Um, he's going to see the film, though. We're, we're doing a recording. We'll make sure he sees it. So I just like everybody to sort of remember him because he's really, and if you look up there and see that giant victory medal, that was his idea. The, the pen that you've seen in the last several years, those are his ideas. So I can't, uh, can't not talk about that. Just to talk about the end of World War I, I can do it through my grandfather's eyes and tell you what happened with him. Um, he was fighting with the 81st Infantry uh, Division and they were in Alsace-Lorraine, and around the third week in um, October, they were moved to go to the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive was the last major offensive. It was meant to end the war, and it was really the biggest offensive the American soldiers participated in, and one of the greatest battles the United States has ever fought, and 26,000 Americans died in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. When he left there and his unit left there, they were sent to another place for a little bit of training, a couple days of R&R, I guess. They boarded the train. They got off the train in the town called San Pigny. They were marched 45 kilometers in snow, rain, wet conditions through the night. They got into the town of San Miguel, and the town was leveled. That was Pershing's first great victory. Um, but they had seen stuff like that before. They continued marching, they went into Verdun, the city was leveled. What they didn't know is when they got into the city, there was an underground fortress the French had built, which had enabled them to withstand the Germans. There was two great battles that fought there. And the meuse Oregon offensive was to the east and the north and the uh, northeast of Verdun. And they marched through uh, Verdun, and they got to the other side of Verdun, and it got daylight. And what they saw then was utter destruction. They, were, they entered the Argonne Forest, but there was no forest. The forest was gone. Uh, there were 800,000 Americans, British, French, and German soldiers killed in a relatively small area there. And what they saw with bones and just uh, unbelievable destruction. They were sent up to the front. And so they were only there in about a week. And the last three days of the war, they had no food, no water, no sleep. Um, <clears throat> and the armistice was, this is the short of it, the armistice was signed in the wee hours in the morning on the 11th. Uh, the soldiers were notified of most of the troops. Now, Pershing did a lot of smart things. He realized uh, the armistice was probably not the best idea. He predicted World War II. He said if we don't drive them back to Berlin and back, all the way back to Germany, we would be fighting this war over again. And he was right. His big mistake, though, was after the armistice was signed, he didn't stop all offensive measures. So he kept fighting up to the last minute, and most of his generals kept fighting. There was a few who did not, but most kept fighting. And many, many thousands of Americans were killed or wounded after the armistice was signed, even up to the last seconds. There was one crazy general who had got wind that there was a shower baths in a German town, or German-held town, and he was determined to take it because these guys had not had their clothes off for 60 days, most of them, um, nor their boots. So you can imagine, they all had lice, they all, all had either had the flu or they had all kinds of bad colds, they had coughs, they were very weak, dysentery. And so he was determined to get into this town. Well, within the last few minutes of the war, he lost, or 300 of his men were either killed or wounded. Exactly, exactly at 11, I, I tried to get a tape, I had a tape of this, but you could hear the fighting, they actually had a top secret tape the American Army did. 
And up until the last few minutes, you could hear the shots going off the shells. It was 24-7, exactly at 11, so dead silence. And the war ended. Technically, the war was not over. It was an armistice. There had been three armistices signed. And um, once that happened, we never actually signed a peace treaty with the Germans until the 1920s. I think Tim could give you a more exact date. Um, so as soon as the war was over, the Germans wanted to fraternize with the Americans, and that was not happening. They came over, they crossed over the lines, we sent them marching back, but basically there was a lot of people that got killed and wounded, taking a few square feet of territory that they could have walked into the next day. But that's how the war ended, and really was the Meuse-Argonne offensive that it put the final nail in the coffin of the war. The French, the Germans, and the English by then had had it, um, but we, we were there and we've, we were the ones that really ended it. And so today we want to remember those people. Now I want to introduce freeholder Ginny Haynes. Uh, she's been a great supporter of the, this project over the last several years. We've been going around every town in the county that was in existence in 1918, 20, 28? 28. 28. You see these service flags. I think she's going to tell you a little bit about them. But she's been with all, all of us through these towns and it's been, it's been great. So freeholder Haynes. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone. Uh, at least it's not as windy as it's been the last few days, so hopefully you can all be, I'm glad we're inside a tent. Um, I just want to welcome you all here today as we conclude our year-long remembrance of World War I. Many thanks to Legion, American Legion Post 129, who are here to help us dedicate a cannon, and also to St. Brendan, the navigator pipe and drum of Point Pleasant. Shortly, we will become part of a nationwide movement in which states, veterans, organizations, towns, and citizens will collectively toll a bell to mark the end of World War I at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. We will ring our bell 75 times to remember all those from Ocean County that made the ultimate sacrifice. 100 years ago today, one of the most deadliest conflicts in history of the human race came to an end. But the carnage was great. Over 16 million people died. The total number of both civilian and military casualties is estimated at around 37 million people. The war killed almost 7 million civilians and 10 military personnel. Here in Ocean County, as the flag here will show, inside this historic courthouse, more than 2,400 residents mustered and were sent off to fight in this conflict. It was more than 10% of the county's population at the time in 1917. 75 of those of both soldiers made the ultimate sacrifice and did not return home. Today we conclude a year of commem commemorating America's part participation in the Great War. We entered the war in 1917, but it had already erupted in 1914. When the World War I started, President Woodrow Wilson pledged neutrality for the United States, a position that the vast majority of Americans favored. However, three years Three short years later, as events grew more tense and heated with Germany, the United States did not stand idly by. On June 26, 1917, the first 14,000 U.S. military troops landed in France to begin training for combat. After four years of bloody stalemate along the Western Front, the entrance of America's well-supplied forces into the conflict marked a major turning point in the war and helped the Allies to victory. When the war was, war was finally ended on November 11th, 1918, more than two million American soldiers had served on the battlefields of Western Europe, and some 50,000 of them had lost their lives. Throughout the last year, we in Ocean County have made certain that those Americans who had lost their lives during World War I and all our veterans throughout time are honored and remembered. From decorating our historic courthouse with patriotic banners and bunting to, pre to presenting 28 of our municipalities, which is the number of towns in which Ocean County, when the war, Great War started, with service flags honoring the war heroes of each town today's event, Ocean County will never forget. And this flag, which you're seeing here, was made by, if I get remember right, the Tuckerton Seaport, no, Tuckerton Stitchers Guild. Uh, these women, they, they put, made all these flags, the 28, and as you can see at the top, it shows the 75 people that had uh, passed, that died uh, at that war. And then at the bottom, it shows the number. Well, each town that we went to had the number of soldiers that passed from their town, as well as the number of individuals that uh, went to war from their town. 
This initiative, as Mike has stated, began with our freeholder deputy director, John C. Bartlett. He was a history buff, and he had read over 100 books uh, on World War I and worked closely with our county historian, Tim Hart, who's sitting over there, and our Parks and Recreation Department to make certain this important anniversary was not going to be unnoticed. Freeholder Bartlett, as all of us call on the board, knows the importance of our veterans. They are all special individuals who, with grace, honor, and integrity, put their lives on the line for our freedom and democracy each and every day. Whether it to be the Great War or the War on Terrorism, the men and women who serve our country deserve our deepest respect and gratitude. It is because of their selfless actions that we're here today, enjoying unbridled freedoms. This is to my last page. Okay. As I conclude my remarks, I again extend my gratitude and that of my colleagues on the Board of Chosen Freeholders to all of our veterans, and I ask each and every one of you here today to do the same. Lawrence Binion, an English poet who wrote for the fallen, stated in his most popular piece, they shall grow not old as we, are, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we shall remember them. May God bless all of our veterans on this veteran day and may God those that served in our military that are still serving to this day and may God bless each and every one of you and may God bless this great country of ours, the United States of America, thank you. Thank you, Freeholder Haynes. I wanted to recognize one person here, Joe Myers. He's been, he's the director of buildings and grounds for the county, and he's been such a great help to us over the last few years, and previous to that, when we were uh, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, without him and his staff, this stuff wouldn't have been possible here. So I just, I wanted to recognize Joe. Um, <laughs> Also, one quick note, um, about a month ago, I had the honor of uh, going to Chicago representing the county and the state at the United States World War I Centennial Commission meeting. And out there, one of the things they're working on is there's gonna be a new World War I memorial in Washington, because really it's never been properly done. Um, and if you go online under the World War I Centennial Commission, you'll see there's a, there, there's a, a link to it. But if anybody's interested in donating that, they're looking for donations to build this. It's a beautiful thing. They've got, the, the plans have been approved and designs been approved. So if you go online, just check it out. And then it's a pretty nice website, too. Um, I want to welcome our George P. Vanderveer American Legion Post 129 Commander Ed Rutler. Thank you, Ed, for coming. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, George P. Vanderbilt, Post 129. I'm glad we're here. I know all the members that are here, which we have our auxiliary sitting over here, and our color guard and our firing squad. And we're really great to be here to take place in this 100th anniversary of the Great War, the cease of the Great War. So again, I want to thank everybody for coming today, and I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. My grandfather was a proud member of your post many years ago. So, uh, I want to also introduce our county historian, Tim Hart. Him and his staff have worked tirelessly on this for the last, I guess, four or five years we've been working on this, um, the various things we've done. So, Tim, thank you. Thank you, Mike and, and Freeholder Haynes and, and uh, the support. It's been fantastic. It's a group effort. Uh, Freeholder Haynes went with us uh, to many of the towns. Uh, Freeholder Kelly went with some and we had our whole entourage, and I think the towns uh, really appreciate it. When Freeholder Bartlett, uh, as you might, may know, he was not only a high school history teacher, a college professor, he has all the coursework for his PhD, and he's a very precise human being. These over 100 books, they're very long books, and he read all the footnotes, and um, so uh, he really he set us on target. He said to us uh, when we started, he said, you know, my grandparents met in Lakewood at the hospital that was there, and he said, if you're doing research, don't go out of your way, but uh, if you can find out the story, and we did, and uh, next uh, May we'll tell you that story. Um, so anyway, so the, the medal that Freeholder Bartlett asked us to replicate um, <clears throat> is this is the real medal. 
Uh, this one happens to be from uh, the Naval at Lakehurst uh, Historical Society. And you can see the size. So uh, the freeholder said, I want one that's about four feet in across. And we said, OK. And uh, so we were going to make it of wood. We were going to make it of aluminum. We were going to make it of all these things. We finally ended up at Digital Atelier, I believe is the pronunciation, up at the grounds for sculpture. And uh, it's made of urethane. And uh, Mary Jane uh, Mahorter um, Behavis did a great job of fixing the paint uh, in the bucket truck there. and. Um, so uh, this is, uh, we thought this might be a, uh, a, a Guinness World Record, but it has to be able to be on a person. And we didn't know anybody big enough <laughs> to do that. So uh, I just want to say that um, uh, we're privileged in Ocean County to have the largest number of veterans. Uh, and many people come here afterwards uh, uh, to retire because it's such a great place. Uh, for instance, the Civil War, there were 440 people who served. And um, we had over 880 people buried in Ocean County from the Civil War because people like my ancestors decided to come here. Once again, Freelder Bartlett is the core of this. Uh, he sent uh, Nick Wood from our office for four weeks. He was away from his family down at the National Archive in College Park, Maryland. Uh, he and uh, Sam Stokes and, and Donna Mal Valtiano, all the people in the office, they, to try to come up with these numbers, this was very hard. They had to go through eight newspapers. Uh, all kinds of records. People didn't always tell the truth. And so uh, particularly towns like Point Pleasant Beach, people said, oh yeah, I'm from Point Pleasant Beach, and they weren't there from all. And they actually went through uh, street by street. So um, if I can now just describe what we're going to try to do with this bell ringing, and this bell is particularly significant to Freeholder Bartlett. This is the bell out of the high school, the old high school. Uh, and they use it as the victory bell now for Tom's River High School South. And when we get done, we're going to try to line up on the sidewalk. And we're going to ask each person here to ring uh, the bell twice. And then uh, we'll count how many people there are, multiply times two. And we should be able to get the 75 uh, uh, rings. Now, the, the library, um, Susan Quinn did a great job of getting us a recording of the 75 uh, bells. Because I don't know if you know this, the recording of the library bell is the bell from the Presbyterian Church. Uh, and because of technology, they couldn't play it today, but it'll actually be part of the, uh, the tape that we're doing. So uh, I want to thank everyone who was involved, particularly Freeholder Bartlett. Um, you know, he really is a man of great integrity, and um, uh, this was very important to him because his opinion is that the First World War is really what set up everything that is today, our international relations, what happens in the Middle East, all of that is out of the World War I. Uh, the American Legion comes out of World War I, uh, and so... Uh, I guess, Mike, if you want to say something, then we'll line up for the, the bell. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so we'll start proceeding over the bell. We have, looks like, about five minutes, so. because of post-129. Without their efforts, they found it. It was in horrible shape, and these guys restored it, and it's, it's magnificent. And with the cooperation of post-129, it's on loan here to the county, and it'll be here for everybody in the county to see. Um, so we're going to unveil the plaque. You guys want to do that? Sure. Okay. Ready? This One, is going to be two, permanently three. mounted here, uh, but for today, it's been mounted temporarily. Tim, you want to say a few words? Just that it wasn't for these two gentlemen. So I need to make sure I get the names right. So it's Al, you're Al, right? And you're John. And uh, John's photos are in the tent, so you can see how they got it. Like Mike said, it was not in very good condition. Freeholder Bartlett insisted on this railroad tie base, which those guys did very nicely. Be, to be historically accurate, right. that's, that's, why it's, that's why it's and, here. Uh, this had no wheels whatsoever. You have no idea how hard it was finding what we have here. <laughs> was too. And, and was, was it the story correct? This was in Iraq? No. It was never no, it, was, Iraq. it was a training piece over Fort Lewis. It was a, tra a training piece, okay. All right, I want to call up Brianna Blank. She's an, an employee at Ocean County Parks. We're going we're gonna to do our song, but there's words to the song. And since we have a bagpiper, 
Rianne is going to read the words first, and it's very, they're very, very fitting words for the end of World War One and what we're honoring here today. Once the words are done, our bagpiper will play and the ceremony will be over. When the battle's over, I return to the fields of glory where the green grasses and flowers grow, and the wind softly tells the story of the brave lads of long ago. March no more, my soldier laddie, there is peace where there once was war. Sleep in peace, my soldier laddie, sleep in peace, now the battle's o'er. In the great glen they lay a-sleeping, where the cool waters gently flow, and the gray mist is sadly weeping for those brave lads of long ago. March no more, my soldier laddie, there is peace where there once was war. Sleep in peace, my soldier laddie, sleep in peace, now the battle's o'er. See the tall grasses there awaiting, as their banners of long ago, with their heads high forward threading, stepping lightly to meet the foe. March no more, my soldier laddie, there is peace where there once was war. Sleep in peace, my soldier laddie, sleep in peace, now the battle's o'er. Some returned from the fields of glory to their loved ones who held them dear, but some fell in that hour of glory and were left to their resting here. March no more, my soldier laddie, there is peace where there once was war. Sleep in peace, my soldier laddie, sleep in peace, now the battle's o'er. Thank <laughs> you.